Your Spirit is always with us. Give us the grace to know you and to love you. Lead us not into temptation, but free us to serve you instead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think I told a couple of you that uh, last week that I recently saw the movie Les Miserables, which is amazingly still out in theaters, or at least it was last week. Uh, So I want to apologize ahead of time for folks who haven't seen it yet, but I'm going to go fairly far into the movie in terms of plot. But don't worry, it's still worth seeing, even when you know it's going to happen. Do you want to... Are you okay? Oh. No. Okay. So at the beginning, we meet Jean Valjean. He's been working at hard labor for 20 years, the first five because he stole a loaf of bread uh, when his little nephew was starving. But when he tries to escape, he got another 15 years of punishment. And as the story opens, he's finally served his sentence. But because of that escape attempt, he has to carry a paper with him at all times, saying that he's a dangerous criminal, and he has to report for parole every month for the rest of his life. All this makes it impossible for him to make an honest living. And he's as poor and hungry, if not more so, as he was before he went to prison, with even fewer chances now. But in the course of an encounter with a kind priest, Jean Valjean comes to believe that God is calling him to live another kind of life. He tears up his identification papers and becomes another person. And with this fresh start, over several years, he's able to establish a business and become a mayor of a small town. He becomes a totally different person. The people there depend on him for trustworthy leadership, and hundreds of workers rely on him for their livelihoods. But then his past come back, comes back to haunt him. Jean Valjean learns that someone else has been captured in his place and is about to be sent into hard labor because the authorities believe it is him. He's torn about what he should do. Of course, he doesn't want the other man to suffer, but the life that Valjean has built is as a pillar of his little community. Without him, things may simply begin to fall down for the people there. So then he sings this awesome song about trying to figure out what he should do. Um, Anyway, and then I won't tell you what happens next. All right. But there was a, a really good song that he's singing. Hugh Jackman's really good in it. Okay. So Jesus' temptations in our scripture today are in the same family as the one that Jean Valjean faces. His temptation isn't to do something bad or to hurt someone or to turn to the dark side, necessarily. Luke, turn to the dark side. Sorry, anyway, really, okay, no one here is a Star Wars fan except Scott? All right. Thank you. I got it. Thank you, Scott. All right. Really, the temptations that Jesus faces are to do something good that comes at the expense of doing the right thing. First, the devil tempts Jesus to turn stones into bread. What could be more noble of a cause than making sure you'll survive just by transforming a few stones? The devil knows Jesus can do it. Jesus knows he can too. And here is the solution to a couple of problems. The first one... Uh, of being being Jesus, being able to eat, since he's pretty hungry during 40 days of fasting. And secondly, to prove to the devil that Jesus really is the Son of God. That would bring an end to all this temptation. And yet, if Jesus were to turn stones into bread, he would not be doing the right thing, however seemingly logical and easily justified his actions might be. Turning stones into bread means not trusting God to provide, and making the material more important than the spiritual in his understanding of what he's on earth to do. Jesus' second temptation is to bow down to the devil in exchange for being given the power to rule all the nations of the world. On the one hand, it's interesting that the devil um, believes he's the one who's in control. He's the one who can dictate who rules the world. Uh, And Jesus doesn't contradict him on it either. But imagine what good things Jesus would have been able to do if he were emperor of the world. We can only imagine what a gifted and caring and just ruler Jesus would have made. All for the price of a little worship for the devil. And yet, even though it would have enabled Jesus to do a great deal of good, this temptation takes takes Jesus away from doing what is right, worshiping God and God alone. Finally, Jesus is tempted to test God's care for him. 
The devil takes him to the biggest city in Israel, Jerusalem, and sets him on top of its most public building, the temple, and dares him to jump off. Which at first glance does seem a little foolhardy, right? But it could have been a good way to prove to people who Jesus is. When God kept him from dying after a big jump, everyone who witnessed it would know that Jesus was a spectacular person. They might even realize, as the devil is trying to make Jesus prove, that he is the Son of God. Which means lots of power and Twitter followers and influence and the ability... No, no, thank you, Linda. And the ability to influence others for good. For the good of the world. But that would all come at a cost to doing what is right. And to respecting God's plan for Jesus. Jesus wasn't among us to dazzle and overwhelm. He was there to announce, but to leave us with a choice, to decide to follow this new way, to enter this kingdom of God, this realm, this ecology of our own free will, with our own love given freely. So what makes it possible for Jesus to resist temptation? I'm tempted to say that he passed the test because he was the Son of God. But then that's kind of a snap answer, right? It doesn't help those of us who happen to not be wholly divine as well as wholly human, right? Notice that Jesus has a scripture to answer each of the devil's tempting suggestions. The scripture grounds him in who he is and who he is in relationship to God. The thing with being in the wilderness, like Jesus was, is that it can disorient us, separate us from our habits, from the relationships that give us a sense of continuity, Retreats from the usual, fasting and isolation, help us to break free from our ruts, but they also put us in a place where we can lose our sense of rootedness. Which is why spiritual practices are so important, not just in the day-to-day, but in those moments when we're in the wilderness, pulled away from our usual context and into great possibilities and competing temptations that seem like they could be good even if we know that they go, get in the way of doing what is right. Jesus is just soaked in scripture. It's in his heart. And it gives him the grounding and the strength to resist the temptation to do evil in the name of good. So now, as you can see, we've got kind of a walking path. Folks have been asking about this, right? We've got kind of a walking path for meditation laid out. Um, I was thinking about, I was modeling this after um, labyrinths that are used in some churches and sacred places as an instrument of prayer. Of prayer. A labyrinth is like a maze, except there's only one path into the center and one path out, the same path out. You can't get lost. In the late Middle Ages, labyrinths became a way of going on a pilgrimage when a Christian wasn't actually able to go to the pilgrimage site whether because of infirmity or poverty or other obstacles. The labyrinth symbolized that journey. So I'd like us to use this path as an instrument for prayer and meditation on spiritual practices, on good and bad temptations, on Jesus' journey in the wilderness. So take some time at the beginning to contemplate. Is there some temptation you face to do the wrong thing in the name of a good thing? Is there something that grounds you or a practice that you'd like to return to to give you that grounding? How does Jesus walk with you on your journey? Then take some time to follow the path, using it as a guide to where you're walking. So you don't have to think too much about where you're walking. Oh, about the walking. And when you get to the center, which is over here, Consider whether there is something you would like to let go of and offer to God, or whether there is something you would like to ask for as a gift from God. So the beginning is right over here at this cross, um, and the path will take you around. We'll move some of our stuff out of the way. Um, but let's, uh, let's do a song of preparation together, and then when you're ready, uh, we'll walk the path.